couple of producers and three scientists, and they talked for maybe two and a half hours, and out of that came this one little nugget. But it had an actual measurable impact on the ultimate film that's being made, um, which I think is fantastic. And I can tell you that the characters are part of the physicist, but that got leaked to I and I, and therefore I'm allowed to talk about it. Yeah. I didn't leak it. Um, we were helped out with Fringe. Those of you who've seen Fringe, you know that the science on that is <coughs> perhaps not science. <laughs> that is actually more quick questions and fact checking. We are hoping that as our junior writers move up into more senior ranks and have a little bit more clout, they'll be able to push some better science. Um, there was one episode in particular of Fringe that I remember watching and thinking, oh, this is actually much, much better than usual, and I emailed Glenn. And he said, oh yeah, that was, uh, you know, Ricardo, who's a neuroscientist, like the book with. He gave us that whole plot, and we just lifted it and put it in there. So Ricardo was thrilled, because his idea got turned into this, like, wonderful uh, mainstream TV show. And the science was actually much more accurate than it had been in, in the other episodes um, up to that point in the season. So Ricardo kind of feels like, even though he had a couple of consults, that he felt they didn't really listen to him, this was one where he felt I actually had an impact. And Caprica debuts later this month. We actually found that they're tech consultant. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm not sure. There's rumors that there's been some trouble on, you know, with, between the writers of the studio or whatever. But I'm actually thinking that's, I'm really looking forward to that because I know the scientist that we hooked him up with, and he's excellent. And not only has he given them scientific advice, but he's also been able to work with references to his favorite philosophers. Um, with what fields of science? Everything. They want biologists, they want geneticists, they want nuclear physics, wormholes, alternate models of gravity, neuroscience, genetics, acoustics, biology. Um, the weirdest request was we got a request for an expert on the Stardust Mole, which there is one, Ken Catania. <laughs> and uh, he was on the wrong coast, and so they ended up having to rewrite their script. But um, ideally, they apparently this creature was um, uh, the inspiration for a monster in this one movie. It wasn't Cloverfield, it was one of the others. But it was based on this thing, and they wanted to talk about some of the underlying science. And that's what kind of I want to talk about next, because as hard as we, it's nice to know that we've had these minor successes, that we've had an impact on science and entertainment, but I've been doing this a year now, and I keep thinking, well, it's not enough. <laughs> and uh, there's only so much we can do working within narrative because ultimately the story is going to win out. You must at some point take some liberties in order to do a great story. So, how can we work with Hollywood to, if we, you know, we can help their narrative. At some point we know they're going to take liberties. Um, but how can we get the real science out there? And uh, I'm going to skip over this slide because I want to get to the good stuff. <coughs> um, this was our zombie science night, by the way. One of the things, <laughs> that is George Romero with two of our scientists. Author of War Essentially, we did a zombie science night. Uh, this was my attempt to show Hollywood that there was, you know, we, we're not just sci-fi, that science fiction isn't everything. No one could believe that zombies could have science to it. Those of you who read science blogs know that, you know, we're all, we're all zombie fans. So, you know, there's tons of papers out there. We got, that is uh, Stephen Schlossman there on the far right. He's a Harvard psychiatrist, and he wrote uh, that famous internet mock paper on the zombie brain. And uh, that is Robert Smith, question mark. Uh, most of you blogged last summer, including Cocktail Party Physics, about his paper applying epidemiological models to zombie outbreaks. And he, they each presented shorter versions of that, and George Romero talked about making his film, it was his new one, Survival of the Dead, which as you might expect is just one great war fest. <laughs> and Romero was just tickled. I mean, he of course makes zombie movies, and he doesn't know anything about science, but he loved sitting down and meeting with them. So this is one way, I think, that we can build on this. We've been holding more and more of these screenings and panel discussions. Uh, earlier this week, um, I think on Wednesday night, in Washington, D.C., we staged a screening of Creation, the new Darwin biopic. And we put John Emile, the director, and Randall Keynes, who wrote Annie's Box, on a panel with Sean B. Carroll, I think a good friend of yours, PZ. Um, and um, another woman whose name is Maxine, something that the Academy supported. And Bob Mondello, NPR's film critic, moderated, and we packed the house. And we talked not just about the making of the film, but about Darwin, about Evo Devo, you know, what evolution was and how it's evolved since Darwin. We talked about this crisis of faith. Um, it was a way to handle that discussion in, in the, in the, uh, uh, with a film, in the context of a film that people were already interested in seeing. And that is one way where I think that we can really get down to the nitty gritty, use entertainment as a springboard to have these very intelligent uh, discussions about science and entertainment. 
Um, again, very clear about what it, Hollywood can do and what it can't. It can inspire. Um, how many scientists have I interviewed, and other people here have interviewed, or maybe you yourself are a scientist, you saw a movie, a TV show, you read a book, a science fiction novel, and it made you want to be a scientist. And it really didn't matter so much whether that was accurate science. Um, I think uh, one of the rocket pioneers, Goddard, um, read Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon, it made him want to become a rocket scientist, made him want to build rockets to get to the moon. The science of that book, that, that, that book was terrible. <laughs> It was okay for you know the late 18th century, but it was not good science, and yet it, it inspired this young man to go out and change the world. So Hollywood can really, really have a tremendous impact on that. It can definitely help change public perceptions of both science and scientists, and it can embed the occasional teaching moment. I mean, I've built a whole career on these, um, where yes, the science might be incorrect. Um, Jim Kakalios, who wrote The Physics of Superheroes, uh, talks about this, that he can take something in a superhero movie and say, okay, this is how it works in this fictional world. Um, it doesn't work that way in the real world, but it is inspired by this, and here's how it really works. And it's a way of engaging their attention, um, something they're already interested in. Jim actually made a YouTube video that many of you have perhaps seen. It's almost gotten, I think, close to 2 million hits at this point. Because he worked with us, he was the science consultant on Watchmen during our pilot phase. That was a natural fit. He loves comic books and he wrote a book about superheroes. He was a huge fan of Watchmen. When he got the call from us, would you like to work on Watchmen, he said, I did a happy dance. <laughs> I hung up the phone and did a little happy dance because I would love to work on Watchmen. Very little of his input made it into the final film. Um, but he formed a relationship with particularly the art directors, uh, Francois and Alex, and they have gone on to consult with him on other projects. And because of his involvement with Watchmen, he got permission to in making ourselves irrelevant. So we want to work ourselves into this new interactive online multimedia environment, and I think we're all very well poised to do that. I'm sure all of you are involved to some level in that area. And I'm basically here to hear what you have to say, let you know what we're doing, um, take your ideas back, you know, so that people who actually can make this stuff happen um, can take your ideas and help work to make those a reality. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn it over to Tamara because she's going to give you an overview essentially of what she sees that's already out there. And then we're going to open it up. Hey everyone, I'm Tamara Krinsky and I'm a print and broadcast journalist and an actress. And I've been a media producer for, well, pretty much since the first internet bubble. I worked at a place called the Digital Entertainment Network, which was around in 99. And it was one of the first places that actually tried to create original content for the internet. Um, the pipes went on there, <laughs> and they made the mistake of giving everyone who worked at the company a very pretty Mercedes, so the company is not there. <laughs> but it was a really good lesson in creating custom content for the internet. And since then, I've worked at an interactive ad agency, creating content for clients such as Discovery Channel, and had a lot of opportunity to sort of see what's on the cutting edge of new media. And as Jennifer said, as we have all this incredible sort of eye candy that's happening now on the internet, where will blogging go? Where will you know text-based blogging go and where will that fit in? Um, so I'm gonna go through and show you a couple of things that are what we would like to say are, are sort of on the leading edge of what's happening in new media and talk about where we fit in afterwards. Um, the great thing about Hollywood is it has a lot of money to put behind things. So, it used to be, you know, when you were marketing a film, right, let's see if the PowerPoint works. I'm not I a PowerPoint <laughs> person. I don't know if it'll work like Microsoft has said, so let's see. Um, let's try this instead. Um, so, as we were saying, Hollywood has a lot of money to put behind things. So, it used to be that when you were creating an ad for Star Trek, you would throw up a couple of pictures and a description. And instead, now they get to create all of these incredible applications for different things that you can do online. So this is getting there, we're getting there. OK. So this is a banner ad that was created by a company called Avatar Labs. And as you can see, it took, this was placed on MySpace. And the thing that's really interesting about it is instead of just being one image, You've got um, a trailer that plays in here. You can click on different trailers, play different things. There will be audio if you want it. Um, it's got video. <laughs> but the other thing that's really interesting about this is they've got this little Explore the Bridge feature. So you click on that, and then in a second, you'll actually be able to, should be able to, slow it. Um, you could mouse over.